Hello and welcome to Asia TV in conversation with Taha. We have a guest here today. She is a doctor, a mother, a budding leader, a mentor. She is Tosin. She grew up in Nigeria where she completed her undergraduate degree. She spent over 10 years in medical training in the UK and is currently working in the NHS as a consultant in old age psychiatry. She also completed a master's in global mental health at the King's College London and London School of Hygiene and tropical medicine. She has women's health and well-being close to her heart. Welcome to Seen to the show. Thank you very much for coming in and taking the time out to come here in our studio. Thank you, Taha. What an introduction. <laughs> I'm excited <laughs> to be here. Well, the thing is, you're, you are doing so much work. You're a multi-talented multitasker. And I've been told women are really good at multitasking. I think we are. Better than you guys. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. I'm a multitasker too, you know. <laughs> no, I wouldn't hug you. Okay. Not here. Okay. That's, that's, that's good. So tell us, tell us about yourself. Tell, your, tell us about your early life, your university life. How did all that go? Yeah. So uh, obviously I'm here in England now. I've been here for 13, 13 years. I um, was born to parents, poor parents are from Nigeria. Okay. Um, my father is a doctor, mom okay. is a ph pharmacist. They still both live out there in Nigeria, uh, sort of running their own private practice. I'm the firstborn of eight children, so sort of a natural leader by force, if you, you know, sort of imposed on me. Okay. Um, so born and bred in Nigeria, schooling all our day in Nigeria, went into university and went to study medicine. Okay. But that wasn't my choice originally. Mm -hmm. uh, left to me, I was going to study law. Okay. But my father, in a crafty way, mm -hmm. along with my grandmother, who's a maternal one, okay. um, just sort of spawned a way to steer me in the ways of going to medicine. Uh, do I regret it? Not. Okay. okay. Sometimes I do feel like perhaps I, I would make a better lawyer as well. Right. But long story, you know, to cut short, went into the University of Ibadan graduated um, mm -hmm. MBBS okay. and soon after ended up in the, in the UK. So I think that is my background in a nutshell. Yeah. Okay, but what I've learned from people is that in Africa it's really difficult to get into a medical school. It's really That's expensive right. as well. Right. So how did, how did all that happen? How did that pan out for you? Um, yes, it wasn't easy, okay. I must say, because I think the selection process was rigorous and there were sort of two exams you do. You know, there was a joint admission and matriculation board thing. Then there is the equivalent of the GCSEs. Okay. Um, we, we call it SSCEs, the senior certificate examinations we would do. And I, I think one of them, I just about scaled through. Okay. And this grandmother of mine, you know, there's a supplementary list. And I remember her going to sit in front of this dean's office okay. all day long to right. say, this daughter of mine, yeah. even though she's just a bit below the quarter, she needs to get in. Right. So I got it, really. Okay. Um, I'm grateful for that. And so, yeah, medical school j j just did what I've got to do, really. Uh, my parents, uh, I would say I'm, I was unfortunate. Mm -hmm. They're not rich or wealthy by, by the standards, but working middle class. So okay. with eight children, mm -hmm. uh, but all of us have gone into university and come out. So it, it was doable. That's great. That's yeah. very good. Yeah. So uh, old age psychiatry, yeah. what is all that about? Oh, okay. So that's my passion. Okay. You call it my baby. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's where I specialize. In, uh, that's where I work. Okay. That's my bread and butter day in day out okay. now. Um, so came into the into the UK, um, and in order to specialise, you sort of start off in what's called a foundation program, mm -hmm. which uh, it's almost been as soon as you become a doctor, your mm -hmm. first year, your first second, your first two years, you are a doctor going through different departments, right. and round about the end of second year, you need to make up your mind where you want to spend your life being. Right. Okay. Um, you know, it's a bit early on to make that decision, but I had always known that I wanted to be a psychiatrist. Okay. All right. Um, started off general psychiatry training, then ended up with a specialist training of old age uh, in the way it's structured. That takes about six years. If you pass the exams at the right time and all of that. Wow. Plus two years, that's eight years. This is after you graduate as a doctor. Okay. You spent so many years of training, mm -hmm. qualified as a consultant uh, in old age psychiatry okay. in 2015. Wow. And, um, and, you know, gone for a master's as okay. well. Mm -hmm. And uh, been working as a psychiatrist since. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's it, no, not sure. Okay. 
So, you know, with the aging population in the mm. UK, mm. what is your take? What's going to happen? Because there are a lot of people who are growing old, but we don't That's have right. enough young people joining the bandwagon per se. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I suppose because we are lengthening the, the lifespan yes. in a way because of advances in, in medicine, in technology. And as we are doing that, we're almost in layman terms patching people up. Okay. Because we catch the heart attack on time, right. you know, and people, you know, um, survival rates are sort of increasing. Mm -hmm. But because of that, also people sort of leave well into the sort of nineties, yes. Which is the reason why you know illness such as dementia yeah. has become a global burden. True. You know, yeah. the economic burden. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a it's a public health concern really yeah. across the world. Yes. Um, in England, I think it's just under up to one million people now, as are the last count, okay. suffering. And that's a lot of implication for health care um, and delivering care for them, social services, right. rising costs. So things won't get any easier. Right. And the difficulty is there is less and less fewer specialists you know, in this field. Okay. So I think you know, we are looking at a problem on our hands. We mm -hmm. need to be thinking ahead of how to tackle this. Right, um, right. Yeah. So uh, while we're talking about dementia, now mm. I know there are specialist care homes and there are specialists like yourselves That's who right. are taking care of them. There are carers around the clock who mm. are taking care of these people. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, the cost is very high. Yeah. Where, do you see, where do you see people going from here? Who's going to bear that cost? Because some people cannot just afford this kind of uh, care. That's right. Now that varies from place to place, yes. obviously. So mm -hmm. uh, take the UK, for instance, where you know, uh, there is a system, yep. the healthcare and adult services, yep. and day in, day out, we banter and sort of argue as to where the funding comes from. Yep. This is because of the way, so the, it comes from the central government, yes. but then it gets shared into the health or yep. into social services. Right. Now, who funds this? Taxpayers' money. True. You know, we put the money in there, yep. you know, and um, national insurance and all of these things, and the way the pot is divvied up. Yep. Uh, from what you say, you've entered that, uh, that already. Yeah. The amount of money going in is mm -hmm. probably is not enough. Right. It's, it doesn't meet what's yeah. coming out yeah. at the other hand, yeah. and that's partially why the NHS is also in crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, today, mm -hmm. lots of savings to be made. Yeah. Efficiencies. Um, we should work in a more efficient way, but with less cost. Right. As we are um, care homes, as you asked, you know, I think. The use of technology is a way to look into it. Right. Um, perhaps scaling up, yeah. building capacity, mm -hmm. such that some things that are done by specialists only, right. you want to train sub-specialists in mm -hmm. a way. Um, and again, uh, family members, carers, to be more involved. Right. It all varies. If we talk about other, say Todd Ward, for mm -hmm. instance, yes. that's a whole different ballgame entirely, depending on how much, how many people are diagnosed with dementia in the first place. Right. There's a lack of tertiary care services. Mm -hmm. Many of this is subsumed in the family network right. at home. Okay. They might not even know that grandma has dementia. They just think she's just been an old woman. So it varies. Okay, okay. Yeah. So while we're talking about technology and mm. NHS, we mm. know NHS is in crisis. We mm. know there's a lack of doctors, yes. there's lack of nurses. That's right. uh, how much do you think technology is going to replace humans? Because <laughs> Uh, right now, if you're lacking 2,000 nurses, That's right. I don't think technology can actually cater for those 2,000 nurses. No, I, I agree. It, it wouldn't, although there is a role for technology now. Yes, you know, is. Medical informatics, robotics. Yeah. Um, it's a bit scary, mm -hmm. especially as human beings, to think that your job is going to be taken away from you yeah. um, in a way. But the, the fact of the matter is there's not enough in terms mm. of of um, the manpower. So there, there is role for technology. Instance, we, an example would be assistive technologies, okay. is what's called. Mm -hmm. These are sort of use of devices, right. medical devices, to help people with memory problems. Mm -hmm. um, now, there are other devices and aids that are already known that people would use for physical disabilities or sure. mobility problems. Uh, example, you know, so wheelchair is, yep. is, is technology yep. but i'm talking more niche things for people with dementia and memory mm -hmm. problems so example mm -hmm. would be automated devices okay. um, example might be recorded 
recordings that's placed near the door with a sensor. Right. So someone who's forgetful, the girl, they leave home alone. Yeah. We're trying to maintain their independence. Mm -hmm. They get up, you know, get towards the door or so. A voice thing might just come up, activated to say, you know, remember to lock the door. Yeah. Or in the kitchen, they've just finished cooking, turn off the home and you know, there's this prompt and the person, right. you know, right. at least. So yeah. there, those are examples. Medications can be dispensed that way rather than having a carer go in in four times a day yeah. to do that. Yeah. There are these things already being used in the UK, mm -hmm. um, in care homes, right. example would be for safety, for yes. instance, mm -hmm. um, when people are at risk of falls, there's a sensor put on the bed. Okay. When they get up, it alerts the nursing staff to, to check on them. Okay. There is telecare. Mm -hmm. Now, all of this, there's GPS tracking. Right. For the person has a tendency to wander off and get lost. Right. Okay. Of course, technology is not fail proof. Yep. Because there might be lots of lots of signal, lots of mm -hmm. battery mm -hmm. or something, mm -hmm. um, and all of these things. Th there is the ethical mm -hmm. implication. How much do you do you are you imposing on somebody? How much are you limiting the basic human right? Right. All in the name of um, taking care of them. Taking care of them and independence. Yeah. You yeah. see. Yeah. So a, a bit complex. Right. Not, not that Actually, my ne next question was about mm -hmm. the eth ethics and how the ethical committees are allowing this. Would I call it invasive or yes. would I not call it invasive? Yeah. When I'm prompting someone, mm -hmm. it could be invasive. So how do you see people are going to tackle that issue? Well, I think at the moment, the way things have been dealt with is in a, we call it, multidisciplinary team okay. approach. Mm -hmm. Basically meaning every professional that's involved with the patient, right. starting from the GP, mm -hmm. the specialist, the psychiatrist, the yep. occupational therapist, anybody mm -hmm. else that the patient is dealing with might even be the police right. as well. Then with the family mm -hmm. or the loved ones yep. or whoever's looking after them to say, in this person's best interest, now, the first thing is the person's consent. Somebody else might be able to give consent, yeah, don't mind. So, yeah. Somebody else can give consent. Mm -hmm. It's about whether they still have the capacity. So I yes, there are ethical issues, but mm -hmm. when the team does agree that this is a way to go, mm -hmm. because of a role, yeah. it's better for them, yeah. because knowing that it would provide independence mm -hmm. with all this technology, rather than being stuck in a care room, Early on. Early on early so uh, those are the conversations okay. that we have. So let, let me give you an example or a scenario. Mm. Say you have a device which can measure the proximity, temperature, humidity, geographical coordinates, luminosity, all these of a yeah. home yeah. of these elderly people, a couple or maybe an elderly person living mm. by themselves. Mm -hmm. What do you think would be the take of people of such a device in the UK? Because this is saving you from all the human intervention that you needed in your home. Now. The first thing that comes to my mind is isolation. Okay. Yes, all these things are fancy and they work, and yeah. le let's assume okay. that they work. Mm -hmm. There is a role for human beings True. for the touch. Yeah. We know that social isolation is a huge factor in, in depression, True. Um, in the elderly as yeah. well. So when you substitute, uh, you know, even now, I see patients you know, many times a week where at the core of the matter is social isolation. Okay. So it's not as straightforward, and I, there are policies governing all these things. I, ultimately, I don't see that being an all or none as a way that we will go down fully. Okay. I imagine it will be a mix and match. Right, yeah. right. And um, I mean, lately you must have read in the newspapers that the biggest problem which UK is going to face mm. or is facing is loneliness. About right. 30 to 39 mm. percent are actually lonely. Mm. They don't even have anybody to talk to. to. Talk to. So what's, what's happening with people? Why is, why is this isolation happening? I'll give an analogy. will be you and I, we're still youngsters, yeah. but we go on the London tube mm -hmm. and everybody's like that. Yes. It's either their phones or yeah. a newspaper. Yeah. There is a, there, there's something that's gone wrong in our culture. Right. So Take that on sort of getting older, you yeah. know, nobody says hello. Some people still live in the countryside and they're lucky to have neighbours that are checking on them. Yeah. I think then the family units, mm -hmm. the way that things have been fractured okay. as well. Yeah. Uh, what we put, the emphasis on, on family and togetherness and culture seems to have broken down. Right. There's the influence of migration yeah. where people had minimal few family members anyway, yeah. and due to bereavement or some other reason, economic migration, yeah. um, 
you are alone. You just find yourself alone. Okay. So yes, there are charity groups set mm -hmm. up like mm -hmm. Befrienders. Yeah. Um, you know that in different sort of aspects of, of the UK, mm -hmm. um, and I imagine other places in the world will have them. Right. That you can call on, but it's not the same. Mm -hmm. So a stranger comes in and they befriend you and a face to come in and break up your day. Right. Isolation is a key issue. Right. It's worse at Christmas time, I tend to see. It's worse around festive seasons. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the winter is there, mm -hmm. it's all dark. Mm -hmm. It's a family affair and the person is alone. Right. And what do you get? You get a crisis uh, mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. How do we tackle it? I need to say as well, it's not only a problem in England. Okay. Isolation also exists in the third world as well. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a myth that other people fear better in Africa. I think they might do, mm -hmm. or in Asia. Right. But survey had been done, and I know there was an, a research that mm -hmm. I read in my global mental health masters right. that indeed mm -hmm. they do get lonely. Okay. So they might be in the midst of the family network. Yeah. But they are, their needs are not, um, are not exactly met because the children are running off, chasing money, or mm -hmm. trying to make ends meet. Right. I don't know. Yeah. It's, a, it's a big yeah. question, I know, at the end of the day. Yeah. But <clears throat> with this uh, technology advancing, mm. I mean, don't you think the isolation is only going to grow more? May grow more, maybe a temporary fix, example. Skyping, mm -hmm. video chatting. Yeah. Now, <laughs> again, uh, that is something as a catch twenty two. Yeah. In this new generation, mm -hmm. if I imagine my generation when we get dementia, yeah. Given that we've used all these phones and gadgets and mm -hmm. all that, and we're used to technology, yeah. It might be that you know we're able to connect and it becomes normal to yeah. carry on chatting to somebody. Yeah. Now imagine, yes, we have the advent of technology, mm -hmm. but this generation is 90, 80, 70 year olds. Not many of them have latched onto Skype in any way. Right. They can't learn it. Now they have memory problems. Mm -hmm. Yes, more isolation, perhaps. Okay. Depends on how to see it. So, you know, um, I actually read about this program which yeah. was being run by a US company. That's right. And um, what they were doing is they were getting these elderly people to teach English to Chinese students. Mm. And that way they would break this monotony of their isolation right. and they would then meet someone online, right. talk to them so, face to face, right. obviously on Skype or some other yeah. software. Yeah. But at least, you know, that isolation part was being taken care of. For and they were getting somebody to talk to. Okay. So, you know, these are the kind of programs which I think could. Uh, you know, cater to the isolation yeah. of the elderly That's people right. and probably also in the youngsters because youngsters also feel isolated. Yeah. That brings me on to the part of asking you, what was the healthcare system like in Africa? Hmm. It, what was and what is? I mean, I suppose things are, depending on, again, where you look at. Because yeah. things vary. The Africa is quite, is a wide expanse, isn't True. it? So thinking of, say, West Africa, as I can sort of talk about, yeah. it, some are doing okay. Mm -hmm. Some countries, some, some are struggling yep. more so. So it's variable. There are strengths, mm -hmm. uh, and these sort of include, you know, they they have the knowledge and expertise on tropical diseases, mm -hmm. the things that you know sort of goes on there. Mm -hmm. There is sort of the willpower to do it, um, and I think there there is good ex expertise, mm -hmm. but things fall down because of lack of resources, um, and now we have lack of equipment, medications. Mm -hmm. I mean, the w WHO, the World Health Organization, mm -hmm. you know, there is a list of, say, basic medications that each department or social have, each specialty or each organ or system. Sure. It will be the basic, the, those ones that we may have or even lack. Right. Whereas these things are things that are obsolete okay. in the first world. Okay. So those things don't help. Right. Um, the other thing is there's a massive brain drain. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the stronger countries like UK will, this is, I'm not making any judgment here, but for attractive, for reasons attractive to the people, mm -hmm. because the government on the other side is not doing well, people migrate yes. for different reasons. So you're losing specialists mm -hmm. from, the, from this world into that. So that is, you know, but from personal experience, I think if I was to call off anybody and ask, they're not very happy. Things could be better, okay. I think. But there are pockets mm -hmm. of goodness here and there. Okay. Um, we fall down on data. Mm -hmm. 
because research also moves things forward True. and we fall down on data collection. Yes. And you need data collection in order to be able to foster research. Correct. So that yeah. is, yeah. So what's your day like? What are the challenges that you face in your day-to-day -day, uh, job as right. being a psychiatrist? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, uh, first of all, it's interesting and mm -hmm. exciting. Mm -hmm. I, I like it, you mm -hmm. know. The seeing patients, bit, connecting to my patients, trying to problem solve, yeah. I enjoy that bit. Okay. Then there is the NHS bureaucracy, yeah. you know, that's a challenge. Okay. There is a bit that we're, we're short-staffed, mm -hmm. we're pressured, yeah. there's winter pressures. Recently you probably heard of it yes. on the news, yes. yeah. and uh, mental health is not spared. Mm -hmm. There is a lack of uh, nurses, workers, doctors, mm -hmm. such that you're spreading across. Thing. In spite of this, there are expectations like you being involved in teaching other doctors, mentoring them, research. Right. Right. It's fitting all of these things mm -hmm. day in day. On a personal level, in my day to day for my work, yeah. if I've seen a very complicated case or two, mm -hmm. you find your, your brain, if you do a good job of it, you're in the story with them. Right. It can be emotionally tasking, if I must say, you find you're quite tired. Right. Otherwise, it's good fun. It's good fun. Yeah. Okay. So while coming on this point, I know you're a psychiatrist, you're a doctor, but how is Brexit going to help you <laughs> with the staffing and uh, with, with all these so shortages of doctors and nurses? I'm not sure if Brexit will help us. <laughs> well, we I all think know it's not going to help. It's not going to help. Yeah. And it, we are already see, you know, seeing it. Yeah. Uh, some NHS trusts have taken initiatives to actually campaign out for okay. us to go to the Philippines, to go to India. Okay. Even you know, develop alliance with, with these other countries, mm -hmm. to train staff to bring them in. Okay. You know, go, you know, advertise jobs. People yeah. are applying from abroad. Yeah. The visas are made easier. Mm -hmm. Some particular specialties, like my specialty, old age psychiatry, is on the shorted list. You right. have a fast track visa to come through. Okay. <laughs> so but in spite of that, especially with the European country, there is the instability. Um, mm -hmm. I think overall, we've lost numbers. Right, right. Yeah. But will it actually fill the short time gap? Because I don't see the short mm -hmm. time gap happening as much as you fast track visas, you cannot yeah. fill in 2,000 nurses or 500 doctors. I don't think it will fill in the short time gap. If, I, if anything, um, for some reason, Say, for instance, of the amount of people that go into medical school, mm -hmm. or even struggling. Right. So the numbers have reduced. So government initiative to get people to come and study medicine. Right. And amongst that, psychiatry is the least popular mm -hmm. of, the mm -hmm. of the specialities as well. Right. So the future looks like it's a bit bleak okay. in a way. Okay. Uh, yes. So, you know, in the beginning you said mm. that you wanted to be a lawyer. Yes. So what are your ca career asp aspirations now? Um, would, would you be a lawyer today if you could? <laughs> No, I, I suppose if I had if I had the time, I might go and do a a, a message, perhaps in ethical, you know, or law, such that I can modify and mm -hmm. be able to talk for people, advocate for people. But no, I'll leave that bit. My career aspirations now ultimately will be to work in policy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I like to sort of be a you know global health policy okay. expert. Those kind of jobs will end up. If mm -hmm. you do really well mm -hmm. in the WHO or United Nations, yeah. because that way, from the top down, I think one can be able to make it, you know, a difference that spans across. Yeah. Um, I have, you know, also close to my heart is a work of stig stigmatization, because okay. mental health is widely stigmatized right. in Africa, in Asia. Yeah. People yeah. don't understand it, and because of that, the outcomes are really poor, mm -hmm. and. Also, the third thing would be affordable health care, mental health care mm -hmm. in, sort of in the third world. Right. So that would be my sort of ultimate goals. Okay. I'm looking, yeah. Right. And do you have any other hobbies, the multitasking bit? What do you, what do you like to do other than your own uh, job? Quite a few things, actually. Okay. Um, reading I like. Reading that's not medical, okay. if I can. Leave mm -hmm. my hands on books, um, follow inspiring people okay um like the first african the first female uh, the liberian president right uh, yeah so reading a, a biography at the moment okay. it's like reading mm -hmm. mentoring mm -hmm. and uh, in this i've grown an interest okay. um in women's wellness right. and mental health because yeah. uh, you know people sort of come my way yeah. and i find that women struggle mm -hmm. 
And I think that's because of marginalization, right. uh, maybe taboo, this is South African. Even when they're professionals, uh, the patriarchal society mm -hmm. in Africa and um, in their relationships, just in their day-to-day self-esteem issues. So my interest is lazy in mentoring and ultimately I'm toying with the idea of perhaps in the end having like a show, mm -hmm. like a talk show perhaps, okay. focusing on women issues, right. um, you know, to sort of empower Right. Empower women. Right. Uh, yes. But other than that, I sort of enjoy the company of my two children that I've got. That's very nice. Yeah. So, you know, while you're talking about empowering women and uh, doing a show on women, mm. what do you think about the FGM, which is very common oh. in Africa? Why does that happen? Now, a lack of understanding. I mean, again, if you draw analogy with it, Ebola that happened. In yes, in Syria alone. In, in Syria alone, Liberia. Yeah. The only way that was eventually tackled was going down to the basic, the values, the beliefs and the culture of right. the people. Right. So it, I think in order to be able to sort of surmount that, mm -hmm. there is a lot of work to do. You can't just suddenly expect it to work to say, thou shalt not do this or, you know, yeah. or punish people. It right. will still be done in secret okay. because the people you're trying to free mm -hmm. themselves probably will think there's no future, depending on what the cultural beliefs are. Right. So, yes, it still happens, okay. and it's a, an inherent issue that much, you know, should be abhorred in this day, really. Right. But until you work, mm -hmm. you know, and of course you can only do this by forming close allies true, true, on, on the ground true. with, yeah, with yeah. the people. So beliefs is quite mm -hmm. a strong thing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. So it is on the ground teaching that has to happen uh, to get rid of this issue I altogether. think, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, without that, whatever mm -hmm. else is done from the top down, yeah. we'll probably not go a long way. Okay. Yeah. And what is your final words to our audience today? What is your general advice that uh, you would like to give our audience today? Well, general advice will be, given we're talking about health yes. and mental health, mm -hmm. uh, is that None of us is immune True. to mental health problems, um, in spite of the stigma and the fear of you know, going to, to talk about feelings or perhaps things that might be strange to us. Right. There is help out there. Okay. And also remember, it happens to the best of us. It can happen to anybody. True. Um, whether it be mild feelings of low mood. Yeah. If anyone is listening in Asia or Africa, Yes, we would sometimes go to the churches or yep. you know, clergymen and yep. traditionalists, but there, there is a role for professionals. Right. And I think, you know, of course, looking after your health yep. is the first thing. Yep. Um, one's personality. At the end of the day, we only have the one life to live. True. And it's about how we live it. Very we true. have a choice. Very true. And, you know, uh, for the most part, we can, you know, uh, I think our health comes depending on the choices that we make. Very true. For the most part. Yeah, some things get thrown your way, mm -hmm. but it's left to you how to deal with that. Yeah. Um, but there is help there. Great. So I'll tell our audience today, I hope you've learned that there's a, there's, it's, not, it's not a problem if you have a problem like dementia or Alzheimer's. There is professional help out there, like Tosin just said. And you can reach out to these professionals, to these people who can help you in your uh, problematic times and do not feel shy about what you are facing people can help you. And I hope you have enjoyed the conversation with Tosin today. Uh, and I thank you very much for Tosin coming to the show thank you, in Taha. conversation with Taha. And I hope to see you soon. Thank, thank you very you much. 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 Thank you, Taha. Thank you. Everyone.